Geez, you're mobile again. What is that? You're mobile again. I'm mobile once. No, it's good. I put on four to six miles a day. Please great. Okay, great. I'd like to call to order the June 26th meeting of the Finance Committee. Um, and I'm going to uh, take attendance. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Here. Councillor Johnson. Here. Uh, and I'm here. Um, so all present and accounted for. Um, we'd like to begin with the approval of the minutes from the May 8th uh, Finance Committee meeting. Hopefully uh, people have had a chance to uh, review those. Um, any, any comments or questions? Yeah, I think the only comment I have, I think you plan to address later, there were some... <laughs> Thank you. There were some items that we said we were going to bring back on the agenda that we didn't, but I think you plan to address that later on. Great. So Great. other than that, I'm fine and make a motion that they're approved if there's no other discussion. I don't believe, do I vote, I, do I vote on even, okay, even though I wasn't well, present. You, you were, I think, probably abstaining because you weren't. Correct. You right. weren't. Yeah. Were. Yeah. Second. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't there. We're getting off to a smooth start. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> hey, it's going better than I can. It's summer. <laughs> it's, it's summer. <laughs> it's summer. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, several discussion items this evening. Um, and I, I think we'll run through those one by one um, and uh, allow uh, discussion and uh, commentary on those. I don't, I don't know that there are you know, any um, issues pending for a decision, but we'll, we'll work through those and see if there are you know, any motions that arise. But why don't we begin then with a review of the bond sale, Tom, if sure. uh, that would work for you. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I assembled a number of uh, related items, I think all, all related to the bond sale, uh, to begin with. As we normally do, we did go out and uh, to, to the bond rating agencies, uh, both Tender 4 and Moody's, the investor service. Um, we can probably comment how long we've been using both of them, but it's been a long-standing practice to, uh, to go out to more than one house uh, to have kind of independent reviews. And it is somewhat remarkable, but there's a lot of same territory that they do really cover. They do have uh, you know, different preferences for sure, and so I, I think it's for the investment of time and effort to actually get to the committees because it's two different discussion committees uh, in the process. Uh, the upshot is uh, our winning to be affirmed. In fact, what has led us to believe during the rating call is I believe that we may actually have seen an upgrade. So I, I wasn't expecting it, but uh, mm -hmm. I was surprised to hear these people possibly. Um, I think they both do a pretty good job of of some of its up, if you will, what our strengths and what our uh, watch areas are. Uh, there's really not much I would, uh, it seems self-evident almost. Uh, it's things that we've been talking about or aware of. Um, Moody's in particular uh, highly weights and covets uh, fund outs, and so that's always going to be a bit of a drag on us. Uh, and uh, they both really observe the amount of, total amount of debt that we're holding compared to a peer group. And, and that's largely what they do, is that they have a vast database of, uh, of similar communities, if you will, and, uh, and that's, uh, among other things, how they come up with these ratings. And, and comparatively, we have a fairly high debt load compared to a peer group. Um, it, again, well within our ability to, to service. Uh, that's, I don't think it's an issue, but just comparatively, that's a, a watch area. I also gave you, at your places this evening, what did your practice do? Uh, overview of the rating process. Uh, for reasons I can't quite understand, but I think Melissa probably did it right, um, both investor services use different rating systems. And I guess it's so they can help, they can monetize and, and, and make their process uh, self important, perhaps. But it does add to some confusion. And I think what's particularly helpful about the third page in uh, is it shows you kind of where we are on our scale. And it's worth noting that in both cases we are considered high grade. Um, on the S&P scale, which is the pinkish beige uh, there's only one more spot for us to go for the uh, We do have some additional room to go uh, with the Moody's rating, but uh, nonetheless it's still considered high grade. So I, I think that might be helpful just to kind of put their process in perspective. And then the rest of the material I provided is specific to the actual bond sale itself. So 
So we had five bidders who were presented the process. Um, as predicted, there were varying levels of bid premium. Again, this is something we don't ask for, uh, but increasingly it is, it is a fairly commonplace. And, um, and there's a fairly wide uh, swing uh, as to which uh, the bid premium was associated with each of these bids. So in the end, we did take the one with the lowest true interest cost, and that's at 2.48%. Sold to Robert Baird and Company Inc. And we were pleased to have uh, Councilor Hayes part of that uh, evaluation of bids and decision as to what to do with the bid premium. So not only once we decide on the winning bidder, we need to decide how we're going to actually use the bid premium. And there are fairly limited options we have in that regard. So you'll see in the second to last sheet. Um, we actually chose to, to buy down the total bond issue, so rather than the authorized amount of uh, 7.78 million, we actually are borrowing only 7.38. So 400 of that uh, bid premium was, was to reduce the overall issue. We offset uh, cost additional to about $68,000. Um, we're proposing to pay first year of interest uh, in FY20, that's about $257,000. And then we're going to show that asset premium beyond that. They, um, after talking with both Bond Council and uh, the Municipal Finance Officer, uh, it was decided that that 39000 what we call excess premium, would, would actually go towards FY21's uh, capitalized interest. It won't cover the full amount of the interest, but it'll help a little bit towards that. So I'd like to ask a question on that. So was there an option to treat it differently, to spread it over the life of the bond, rather than to take it on the front end? Um, Preference is to take it as soon as possible because then it would have some IRS, SEC types of potential issues that uh, neither company really wants to. And we effectively have done that, at least in part, by reducing the total amount of borrowing. Yep. Uh, so I think to your point, we see the value of that long term by reducing the overall issue. Uh, but given the limited aspect of what we can use it for, I think it does make sense to kind of exhaust it sooner than later rather than complicated tracking and reporting and so on and so forth. So that may, yeah. uh, also, it makes sense in terms of reducing the size of the bond, right? Sure. Uh, so it reduces the capital cost. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we've done that in the past. Last year was another example where we did a similar um, use of bid premium. So, so what we will do at the end of this year, since we've already received those funds, is we will essentially uh, commit those, that portion of the capitalized interest for next year and the year after toward, into uh, committed fund balance or assigned fund balance, whichever one it works into. So it won't be, it just doesn't flow back to the general fund because we right. committed it towards another purpose. Okay. And then the final sheet is just the final amortization, actually uh, the resize, what the resized uh, final numbers look like, and this will be folded into our overall debt service obligations. So there's a lot there. I'm pleased to kind of go deeper into any part of that if, if you'd like. Any uh, comments or questions from uh, counselors? Uh, Tom, just go back to the, the ratings. Can you give us some historical background of, of the, the two ratings? And when, has there been movement in recent history? Or? Uh, the old movement's been upward during my tenure, yep. uh, but it, it's been upward. So uh, we can assemble that history if you like, but as I recall, we were holding steady for at least this is your fourth year, I think. Okay. And the last time we did receive a small upgrade uh, on the SCP, I think. And then um, these are actually put on the finance department's website. Yep. And up in the corner for each year that we have, it tells us that new bond rating agencies okay. have given us sure. ratings. Sure. We would be difficult to assemble that, that yeah. historically just so we can track over time, but I don't think you're going to see huge, huge differences. Um, the good news is we're certainly holding our own. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of questions that maybe um, detail, down into detail first. Tom, what we were just talking about, how we applied the bond premium. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like the excess bond premium that we, the 39000 mm -hmm. we had budgeted a larger number than that, right, that we thought we were going to get. Didn't you, didn't we suggest we thought it would be about seventy five, and so we're a little, mm -hmm. little for the, for the budget that's running, right? Yeah, we did so, make some assumptions in, uh, we term them as bond revenues um, yeah. in, in the budget. 
So it was slightly higher than that amount. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a gap there that we will contend with. Would 39,000 be in the budget FY20 or FY21? So the, the budget that we just approved is for FY20. So that prediction. I'll say we're out in time. I, I think the 257 is what could be is what could be compared to what's in the budget. And I right. think you're right. It was something in the order of seven thousand dollar difference. Okay, so it will have a, a slight tweak to the budget this That's year. Yep. Sorry to be the uh, AV guy here, but can we do a sound check to make sure we're hearing you? Because I'm I understand folks at home can't really hear Tom and Larissa and huh? Ruth very well. Sorry. Okay, so there we go. Okay. My okay. apologies. Yes, you're, you're on. Button. You're on now. Yep. Oh, it wasn't. <coughs> Do you I have forgot. five people? <laughs> no. Yes. Uh, he's got an audience. <laughs> uh, he's got followers. <laughs> it's usually being raised. They're all going like this. Right? <laughs> um, and going back to the Moody's report, I mean, the, the, the rating reports we got, I mean, they, they call out the strength of the management team and some other things, but just a couple of things in their grade it's saying okay what are some of the factors for upgrades but what would be some concerns for downgrades and especially Moody's points out geez if, if you know if we have some you know reserve declines I know we've talked about using reserves so that's a caution but in particular as it relates to the finance co committee you know one of the things that could drive a downgrade would be material growth and debt burden and i know as we sit here and we're thinking about our conversations about you know a new primary school which will be 80-ish 70-ish some number like that a new library that's 11-ish um, and a community center i think it's going to be critical to get a better understanding of in, not for tonight, but for, for the finance committee. How do we look at layering? I mean, that's almost going to double our debt that we have. What do we need to think about is when we layer that debt in so it doesn't, we don't get the downgrade. And, and so it's, mm -hmm. just, it's just a question that we'll keep coming back as an agenda item, I think. Because I think it's going to be really sure. critical how we layer those, those capital investments in. Yeah, we can bring to you a full uh, amortization of debt service responsibility for, you know, into the future, and we'll be able to identify when we're shedding debt and when we may be able to take on more. Or, or just what would a better understanding of what would be the trigger that would, would get to that downgrade, you know, how much debt could we take on and not, and not impact our rating, I think yeah. would be. A material increase leaves a lot to the imagination. Yes, what it is does. That? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those legal terms, right? The, right. Yeah, generally, uh, right or wrong, our our, um, our goal has been to, to keep things as stable as possible. I know there's been some concern around that $100 million mark, but yeah. we, we've been hovering around that. And so long as we're consistent, and that also uh, contributes to consistency on the debt service, the kind of impact on the budget, how much are we spending to service that debt, to the extent that we can avoid peaks and valleys, uh, that budget stability has been helpful as well. But your, your point's well taken. On the horizon, there are big ticket items looming. And I know they, they might be colliding all at once, so that, that might be a reason to think about how do we stage them as referendum items going forward. I mean, if they right. all arrive in a year, and that would double our debt potentially that year, that, that might be a, a consideration on how we. How I dare we say that would be material. Uh, <laughs> that probably would be material. Yeah. Remember that the council controls the timing of when something goes to the voters for request. Now, in this instance, the ones you identified, you'll have outside interested parties um, having their own timeline in mind. Um, there might be crises that come up that uh, that require things to move faster. So those are all part of the consideration for sure. Yeah, and the reason I bring it up is probably, I mean, the finance committee, whoever's sitting at that point in time. The town council would probably look at them for a recommendation on when when the, those should be sequenced. So it's just mm -hmm. an ongoing conversation. Probably we should have, and maybe the bond agent can help us get an idea of material and what that means. And the the other, if I may, is uh, one of the things we've tried to do is to reduce how much we borrow each year by taking some of those <laughs> non. <laughs> large items and try to fund them a little bit yes. so or to try and put them through the operating system so if we could uh, really try and do that more than uh, that would probably we can then focus on just those larger items yes resurrect our um, attempt i think she just scolded us but I'm not yes sure. i think so it, that was the plan that was not we the just, intent <laughs> that was the plan we it was well deserved <laughs> <laughs> it was the plan it was gentle thank you <laughs> but point taken mm -hmm.
this year we're never mind. <laughs> <laughs> No, but that's part of the challenge. You know, we, we've consistently been borrowing four to six million per year, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but over time that constant drumbeat certainly adds up. Um, finding a way to uh, minimize those occurrences will help us reduce the overall debt service that much quicker. You know, at some point, just as a suggestion to the chair, I think at one point actually, um, I think the prior finance committee, I think it would probably be easy to dust off those the work that you've done, but you've done some projections about what happens to debt over time and what happens to debt service. Mm -hmm. If that number, if it's in the four to six million, or what do we model? Four to six million and- I've got in my notes, revived debt capacity study. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> wow, yeah, we great, that's eerie that. <laughs> and that exercise took uh, as a starting point what we know as debt service responsibilities for sure, and then layered in an expectation of annual borrowing of Varying levels. I think it was a four, two, four, and six. six. Two, four, and six. And it was pretty material over time. So if it's redone, it'd be, I, I'm not sure we ever shared that with the full town council. So it might be worth bringing back and, and just setting the stage. Workshop material. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was the name of that study again? I usually just in my head call it our debt capacity study. Okay. Um, and debt appetite. Okay. And Not I think, appetite, capacity. <laughs> and Size I, of stomach, yeah. And I think the will of the finance community at that point was to try to target four-ish instead of six-ish. Is that mm. what we ended up the, with? There mm. are some distinct differences in your long-range forecasting if you go from four instead of six. Uh, yep. Uh, any other comments or, or questions on uh, uh, the bond sale? Um, yeah, overall it was uh, fairly painless. Uh, I mean, the, the analysts that you we meet with um, know us inside and out. They, uh, they're fairly, they're very efficient. They're uh, very surgical in their questions. Um, not a lot of chatter or small talk. They go right to uh, the business. Uh, you know, they have full access to our uh, finance reports, and so they, they're able to really focus on the things that are of interest to them. They do speak a foreign language. It's, it's really pretty difficult to... <laughs> For a layperson, it wasn't the dummy 101 version. <laughs> but we were pleased. I think we hit the market at a good time. Uh, the you know the end result of those those rates are, are I think are favorable, um, very much in keeping with uh, kind of what's been happening in that bond market. And I, I think we still enjoy good success by that April May time frame. That seems right. to be a real nice time to hit the market. So thank you. Nice work on that. Uh, one thing that also occurred to me, I know this is going to be part of a, of a longer discussion, uh, you know, uh, this evening and also a longer term uh, this this fiscal year, but uh, in some of their uh, identification of uh, downgrade risks, they also identified opportunities for upgrade. Mm -hmm. And there are some things there that are big themes, like increasing liquidity and reserves, uh, growing our tax base, on the upside and then on the downside, the, you know, we obviously talked about the, uh, the growing debt burden that we flagged, but also watch outs for um, operating deficits, you know, that uh, could result in uh, further declining reserves and then um, um, trend of a tax base decline or demographic profile deteriorating. I'm assuming that means if our, somehow our median income declines or something like that. And um, that's really where we shine. I mean, yeah. we've been very strong performers in all those kinds of categories. And yeah. that's one of the reasons that uh, we'll get into it a little later. Some of the dashboard metrics uh, keep those sorts of things in mind. Right. Just little checkpoints right. so we can be aware of trends. Terrific. So uh, if everyone's okay, I think this... Go ahead. Well, I just want to add one last thing that I thought was really interesting in the Moody's call, I believe it was. The last question they asked was, and this was a new question that we haven't had for the last couple of years, was... What is your community doing to prepare for climate change? What 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 place things do you have in place for resiliency? And that I think is speaking to um, the larger conversation nationwide. And I just think it's important to highlight that Scarborough's proactive approach to that, having a sustainability coordinator, having that be part of our our conversation, um, worked well for Moody's. They were pleased to hear that we were um, not waiting around for the sea to come get us. We were had. Um, staff in place that was having that at the forefront of their job to be thinking about. And so I think that's one of the places for our residents to hear. We invested in that position for a reason brought to us by the Conservation Commission as, as you know, for the council to consider. And the payoff has not just been great service for our residents, but it also is paying off for us in our bond market ratings that 
that proactive sort of approach. So that response worked now. I'm not sure if that's going to suffice and be satisfactory going forward. I'm yep. not sure what will be. But um, I think we should be prepared that that's going to be a normal area of conversation. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, I think at this point might be a good time for us to move to uh, item 4B, talking about the updated dashboard uh, that was distributed. Um, this is Marissa's brainchild, so I'll let her. So, if I may, first thing I want to do is apologize that it's, it's um, unattractive. I understand that, and uh, it's very simple. It, we are in the midst of, it looks kind of like this, it's a plain sheet of paper with a bunch yeah, of numbers. Um, Page 22, yeah. in the, if you have it. Yeah, we're working on soft copy here, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to. <laughs> the, um, the dashboard that I had brought forward to you for, for the previous finance committee to kind of talk about the how it looks and so forth, it's just clunky. I've been building it in Excel. It's not a good platform to be building. SEDCO has great interest in having some dashboarding software as well. And so um, we are exploring dashboarding softwares that would allow us to create easy to consume dashboards for both council use as well as public. Um, and we're just in the, we're in the middle. So this is why you're getting numbers on a flat piece of paper. Um, it will look better in the future, I, I assure you. So if I did give you from the last four years, you can kind of see some trends just by looking at the numbers. But just to kind of go down them and, and from as far as I'm concerned, the, if they're heading in a positive direction or a negative direction, um, would it be efficient for me to just kind of go down the list and, sure. and highlight positive or, or cautionary, and then we can go back and discuss in greater detail if you wish to? All right, so debt service is a percent of annual revenues. I would say that that's a positive direction. Unrestricted fund balance is a percent of revenues. That's heading in a direction we don't wish it to go in. It's a caution. Um, total debt as a percentage of full state valuation is, is a positive number. That's a good trend that we're seeing. Uh, former member, uh, f members of the prior finance committees will know that I don't like this next metric, so debt per capita. Um, <laughs> Any special surprise, reason? Su surprise, surprise. I don't, I don't like it, um, but we're, we're going to just go with the fact that, yes, that is in an increase, and so for most people that would be a cautionary direction. Would you like it better if it were trending in a different no, direction? No, I don't like it, period. I think yeah, per capita yeah. is, a, is not the right way to measure debt, but um, we can talk about that another okay. time. We've talked about it at length what? in the past. Um, total debt per capita as a percentage of per capita income. <laughs> we're holding steady on that until I've got some better census numbers to be working with. They're, it's too fine of a metric to be wanting to use estimates for. Um, we talked about it when we chose that metric that it would be one that was updated, not annually, but um, on a less frequent basis. Non-property tax revenue is a percent of assessed value. So the difference there is that that's our internal assessment, not the full state valuation from the t um, state. That is a caution. We don't like that direction. Okay, that right. that if anytime we see that number going down, it just simply means that our property tax revenue is covering greater amounts of our of our costs. General funds. Does that mean uh, more nonprofits? Is that what it means? No. Or? So less revenue. It means that less revenue from other intergovernmental sources, state and federal. Oh, okay. Primarily so state. Thanks. Case. So that so that property tax rate is picking up right. more and more of the burden. The burden. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so even though this year we did see, you know, we talked a lot at the finance committee levels about how the state has increased the amount of money it's paying towards special education this year from 40% to, uh, I'm sorry, from 40 to 45% this year. Mm -hmm. That's no way to make money. For, you know, that's, you know that, that the increase in special education costs was so much more than that 5% increase in what the state was providing us from two years prior that we're seeing that's not helping us there. And yes, this, the revenue sharing number coming up, we might be seeing a better trend next year. Um, but if we're not getting the money from the state, we're getting the money from our residents. So that's what that is showing. We're still a minimal. Right, yes. absolutely. Yes. Um, general fund expenditure is a percent of assessed value. Again, that's our internal assessed value. That's a positive direction. Okay, and then this is another one that um, I have a really hard time rating as far as positive, negative direction. Qualified applicants to the tax assistance program. Mm -hmm. I, if you'll remember, Peter, um, the first time that we put this out, I put that as a cautionary as we're seeing it rising. Um, the, the, the finance committee at the time um, really felt, though, that that was a positive because it meant that we were serving more people, and, and I can see that. But I think that there should be, if we could have a, a mixed interpretation there. Okay. It is wonderful that we're doing a great job promoting a, a program and that we're getting it out to the people that need that, that help. 
I think that an ever-increasing number of people who qualify for that program is not a, a, something we should celebrate. We, we've also expanded eligibility, which mm -hmm. undoubtedly helped those numbers grow, mm -hmm. right. which again is, I think, a great thing. You've broadened the support. Absolutely. I think okay. there's a lot of things to be really proud about that and, and really pleased that we're, we're helping the people that we need to be helping. I just, it, it makes me uncomfortable to celebrate <coughs> more people needing assistance. But this, this doesn't necessarily mean more people are qualifying, it just means more people are applying, correct? A applying, yeah, and receiving. Okay. And okay. so we can certainly, looked at in that lens, we're doing a great job promoting that program, getting yep. it out to the people that need it, and, and helping to work them through the process to get the, the money in the fall. It's, it should not be considered as an indicator of, uh, of need necessarily, because there's a lot of factors involved there. But. Okay, so any questions about specific measures? Well, I just going back to the debt capita for yep. a second. <laughs> sure. Uh, I just gesture. <laughs> well, no, I mean there was there was a robust debate about that. <laughs> robust. <laughs> yeah. But one of the reasons that partly it's in there because that is a critical element that is measured, at least reported on and measured in Moody's and some other things. It is it is it is whether it's right or wrong. It is a metric that is tracked, and I think that was based on a point in time some suggested metrics that was it our was it our advisor that actually had come up with some things that we had kind of had a he had benchmarked several things and that was one of them that we were looking at well I think it's a real easy one to calculate frankly yeah. and it's a really easy for comparable purposes it's a really easy one to compare to others um, but that is part of why I really don't don't like it yep. so you know the 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 prior metric the total debt as a percent of full state valuation I, I'm, I'm fully and completely behind that one because the, the debt is serviced not by the number of humans in the, in the community. The debt is serviced by the number of, the amount of value that the tax burden is spread across. So the number of people in your town don't reflect the ability of that town to cover the costs of servicing that debt. The amount of value in your town that you're sharing the cost of servicing that debt across through your property tax system is what is showing your capacity or your ability to cover that debt. The innocent suffer again is what you're trying to tell us. Well, I'm just saying that, you know, so we could have a community that has, so we're about the same a number of people as Saco, okay? The city of Saco has about 20,000, Scarborough has about 20,000. But the value in Saco is much, much lower yep. than the value in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. So looking at debt per capita, mm -hmm. there's just as many people, but mm -hmm. those 20,000 people in Saco do not have the property base to handle this debt, mm -hmm. the debt that Scarborough mm -hmm. can handle with the least amount of pain to its residents. So they Does can have a tougher sense? burden even though they have a lower debt per capita. Exactly. Another example would be the town of York. Believe it or not, they have a higher valuation than we do, but they have a population of a third of, of ours. And so I'm, I'm probably taking the most extreme example out there because they're high value, low population. Um, and it, hence why both those measures were yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was a compromise. That's so, what I just got out of it. Yeah, 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 so, <laughs> so I um, guess I, I, we put the debt per capita in there because I. I'm here to just tell you why I like things and why I don't like things, and you're here to make the decisions about how we're what we're going to do. But um, the the I have yes, that is a rising number. I can see why there's an argument why we would not like it to be a rising number. But I guess I would also just say that we can imagine scenarios in which that debt per capita rises not because the town has lost value and is in danger, or not. If these are measures of our fiscal health, our population. Providing it has not lost population because of some sort of plague is not, that's not reflective of our fiscal health. It may simply be that we have, you know, we could imagine that from one decennial census to the next, we have a population shift in which people have stopped having children. So our population drops by 5,000. Well, then our debt per capita has increased significantly, right? But nothing has changed about our ability for households to pay those taxes. Have you pitched us to any of the bonding agencies? <laughs> the bonding, so actually, to, to kind of say to that, our uh, municipal advisor, Joe Kutara, the person yep. who guides us through, he actually, when he saw this metric in here, he, he, was, so distru he was so distressed by it, he called me. He First, he sent me a red line copy with a big old red line through it and a long note about why that was not an acceptable metric. And he called me, and I'm like, Joe, you are preaching to the choir, and I'm telling you, it's staying in because we already hammered this out to death. So... Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a compromise, so, but a different, I, I, just a quick question, I think 
One of the final versions I think you did that was really creative, you also started to do a version that had like green light, yellow light, red light, mm -hmm. that, that really That's started. coming to you. That's coming to us. Okay, okay. and it, the, the just the clunkiness of working in yeah, Excel yeah, yeah. Is, is maddening. So um, on my little cheat sheet here, I do have green, yellow, green, 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 yellow, and kind of thinking about that. So for Don and Paul, this, this was work that had it took a couple of years, I think, mm -hmm. kind of, as you can see, we had these conversations. Right. <laughs> well, and, I remember and, about spurious This was available online with the green, yellow, mm -hmm. red, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, but, but the intent was to really, once a year, be able to have something that can come back and report back sure. to the town council and our public, just what is our financial health and what does it mean and what are we doing? We had kind of finally vectored to a final product, sort of, the last finance committee. Yeah. Yeah. And this was kind of just looping back. So this will be a, a, a process. And then each finance committee can edit. They can make decisions about what may be long on there or not. But that was the will of the prior sure. finance committee. Has so it, just as a backdrop. Are there, and forgive me because they, they could be there, are there comparisons to Cumberland County as as a whole to this, to, um, to our basket of comparable towns? Has there been consideration of publishing those? as well or we certainly could the challenge that we come into each time that we have those sort of conversations is what is what is the stable cohort that we're going to be using as comparison yeah. and the um we i certainly can we have benchmarked some things in the past to kind of look at um happy to do so again i have in my own excel files i've got the the towns that i feel are the best reflection of us as a cohort i've done some i update those on occasion um so I'm happy to bring those back to you if you'd like to see them. I guess if we, if that is something that this finance committee would like to have happen and would like to kind of establish as an expectation for future years, I think it would be a useful conversation for us to just hammer out what does that cohort look like, so that there's not. That know, was my follow-up question. So we've had no discussion in the past of hey, what 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 uh, what are the towns we're comparing ourselves? Because I because in my limited experience and my role so far. It, it always seems to be differing towns depending on what we're talking right. about. So I think it might be worthwhile for there to be a conversation and say, hey, wh what are the six to ten towns that we're going to use? Or cohort or peer group? Yeah. Is, yeah. Yep. And one of the ways that we have, like when we were comparing, so you all saw this chart that went out to you when we were looking at tax rate comparisons. And in that, I, I just so that there wasn't any discussion about picking and choosing, if you will, I used the state defined. Um, service center communities for York and Cumberland County. So that gave us a, a, the state did the work for us. They've defined these as service center communities and we could look at where we fell as a tax rate in those service center communities. Um, that's a very broad list of towns and I'm not sure that there's a lot of value in looking at something as fine as this for all of those sure. communities. Um, but we do have some communities that we know that we are decent on many level comparisons too. So we always compare ourselves to Falmouth and to Freeport and to South Portland. Um, Gorham, Wyndham, Saco, those are communities that we, we really do look to often to, to compare ourselves to. Very often we're asked by residents, you know, why didn't you include a Hollis or, um, or a Dayton or something else? And, and the answer has always been, those are not service center communities. They're very different needs yep. in those communities. Um, but it, it does get complicated when we look at things like general fund expenditure, for instance. If you're Cape Elizabeth and you don't have trash pickup, it, it, it changes what you're spending for your expenditures, yeah, right? So yeah. we don't have an apples to apples community, truly. Sure. Yep. So is there anything that we, we need to do in terms of a formal uh, motion or anything? Or you will come back to us then in some period of time with, uh, Something with prettier? Uh, colors and pie charts and yep. other dashboard looking Icons. To manage expectations, I will not have that for you for July. Okay. Um, but I can, in good faith, attempt to have it for you by August. So good. So we'll put it on the August uh, agenda then, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Would you yeah. like to have at the, in August? Do you want to decide on a handful of communities you'd like to see compared with these metrics? Would that be useful to you? I think it would be worthwhile to at least get specific input from you and have a discussion around it. And, and all of this data is readily available through well, that's, that, that's CAFRS, part of the through other financial reports. So we're not, that's historically been a challenge yeah. doing that's the right. benchmarking is to get people to respond to you with the information. If it's yeah. publicly available, we don't have to rely on them, we can go get it. Yeah. yeah. So through the CAFRS, through Emma, and um, through 
things like this, the states, I mean, the full valuation numbers, those are, those are readily accessible. Um, I think that we should be able to get them through publicly posted resources. For communities that I can't, I'll just be clear about why we're not comparing that community. Sure. So I guess it raises for me a question of timing, like so we're going to do a ja dashboard. This is, I don't expect this is something we're going to be updating every month, you know, be, like maybe twice annually. Yeah. So we'll really once the audit's it. done, then we'll, you know. Uh, you do a year-end 20. We could do it earlier in the spring, but we're deep in budget, so yeah. it's probably going to be the June, July time frame by the time people have the yeah. attention span to dig into this. But we do one for the one just closed, right, for... For 2018. This is FY18. Yep. So okay. the, this is the audit that was completed right. in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the I think actually our if I if I may our mm -hmm. financial and fiscal policy actually says that these will be reported out to you in Q1. Um, they were not this year because the way that this finance committee schedule worked, we just didn't. Um, there were other things that were higher on the the agenda list, and these kept getting kind of pushed off. Yeah. But we would expect to have these available. That'd be great for your January, February meeting. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. And it's worth noting, these metrics are codified in your fiscal policy, so they're not just kind of plucked out of thin air. Part of the hammering out process was inserting them, and I think it was important for consistency over time to make sure that it, they're grounded in a policy that future committee members can look to and understand. So can we have the notes reflect, though, the minutes reflect that uh, the expectation that we would see something uh, in, in August. August and that we would publish something and review that with the council? Uh, yeah, last year, I remember, yeah. Peter, I remember you distributing that grid, uh, green light, mm -hmm. red light, yellow light to council. We'll do it again. In, in what day? Well, we only, we only meet. It would probably be September, so my guess, by the time okay. she All gives right. it to us yeah. in August, we approve Great. it, then the next time the council sits, we Great. could. Okay. It could make the August meeting, but I don't, I don't know the date. Yeah, well, let's shoot August. for September, okay, and then if something changes, we can talk about it in August, All right? Sure. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Anything more, then, on dashboard, or we'll move to the, to the TIF policy uh, item? Uh, I know this is something that's been... Uh, making its way through the Rules and Policy Committee. Uh, hopefully everybody has had a chance to read it. Uh, I know this has been in the wheelhouse of uh, probably Councillor Johnson. Maybe you're going to talk, talk us through where we are with the process and what, uh, you know, I have some questions about what I, what I read, um, but do you want to give like a, a little? Yeah, out? yeah, sure. Uh, so the, um, the reason why this is coming before finance is we thought it best between rules and policies, crafting and tweaking and collaboration with uh, staff, then we'd bring it to finance and then by the time it gets brought to the general counsel, the vast majority of the council have at least had their say or their thoughts and so mm -hmm. this was, the, it's before the finance committee in an effort to, to gain as much um, collaboration as, as possible. Uh, I can tell you uh, some of the things that some of the tweaks that we made, we didn't make a whole lot of tweaks when it came through rules and policy. I think it was a pretty clear vision out of out of our discussions that we had initially. Uh, we had a pretty clear vision of what we what we were looking for, and I think that was delivered uh, on the first go around, so to speak, of what we have in front of us. Uh, on a personal level, I think I, I've been impressed with uh, it's very step oriented and it and it details out a process that will would that's easy for the council to recognize, and it, it's. You can you can see an applicant and you can see where they are in the steps and I feel like that it, it it's it's concurrent between the council's decision making and the applicant and it and I think one of the friction points that we've had in the past was where are we in the process who's involved uh, which counselors or does the council know where we are I think the, one of the greatest strengths of this policy is that it, it spells that out pretty clearly um, that's my intro to it Tom might I'm sure Tom would add to to the intro. Well, I, I think it will serve a, a, a good purpose for the for us, uh, but also for applicants. It, it really sets out expectations, and in doing so, I hope uh, will be a lot cleaner. The applications will be, you know, they can read it and they'll know whether it's even right. worth pursuing, uh, whether they qualify. So I think it, it, managing expectations is a, is a big important part of this for sure. So any, any other uh, comments or questions about the TIF policy? I want to talk uh, for a moment uh, about 
process and timing, but uh, and I had some questions, but did you, Peter, have anything? Yeah, or? I mean, just generally as feedback. I mean, when I look at it, it, there are some things that, you know, maybe have been discussed, but I'd just like to get clarity on, especially a lot of the terms seem vague. So, um, for instance, down under two rules and conditions, tax increment financing, Projects receiving the TIF assistance are public, are public infrastructure projects in support of the development that would typically be projects a community might fund through the general fund or capital fund, but did not do so. So my first concern would be with that, what if something went to referendum and the community decided they didn't want to do it? This seems to be giving the policy the right to override that. And I, I think that's, that's a concern. I mean... The, but did not do so. I think, you know, if it went to referendum and got defeated, the project, I wouldn't necessarily want it to be an automatic approval of a TIF to do that project without going back to referendum. So I think that's vague. Um, again, I think it's really vague. The project, it, um, the project is a public infrastructure project identified as needed by the community or identified public benefit for the community. That's pretty broad. I mean, how are you going to identify something that's needed by the community, who's going to identify that? Should be the comprehensive plan, I would imagine. Um, it seems like it leaves a lot of vagueness and ways to kind of drive a bus through whatever the saying is, the loophole. <laughs> um, you know, then, then another one, the language around the other criteria about the project, development project itself will create will create or retain significant and sustainable employment opportunities. What is that? I mean, is that, again, that's pretty objective. I mean, it's, or subjective. subjective yeah. um, and then the last bullet, the project will enhance environmental protections resulting in a more sustainable community. But how, I mean, the, the, so I think if this is to be a clear architecture, I think all of that language was pretty vague. So that's, that's one area. So can I just speak to that? That, yes. that was intentionally vague. It, it may appear vague when you see it in writing. Right now we have nothing. Well, I know. And so I, this I is that. a huge attempt at saying these are kind of the big mile, these are the things that you need to be, the touchstones you need to be. The determination is entirely ours. Well, but as to but, the level of how well they meet one or more of those standards. Right, but when you say that, and I think this is, <clears throat> so that goes back to the first bullet. Again, if, if, Something has gone to a referendum because it's over four hundred thousand dollars, and the and the voters have said no. This first bullet would seem to be able to allow, and that kind of gets back to another point I have. This would allow when you say we, you're saying the town council mm -hmm. will have that authority to grant it. And I am concerned about the charter and things that are set up. That if the voters have turned down something, I wouldn't want us than having the authority to put a TIF in place that goes counter to what that was. Mm -hmm. that, that, yes, we could have that authority, but as you know, town councils change. So that may be um, an ill-advised decision. Uh, it, it could be ill, be. but I, I think we need to contemplate that in the language. And that is echoed by the excess funds that says, you know, in the next bullet it goes, TIF districts and development programs that include one or more CEA shall include provision that directs any excess funds after the CEA is satisfied to economic development issues or the town's general fund, depending on the council's determination. So again, that seems to be given authority to the town council to maybe do some type of capital project that the charter would anticipate needs to be approved by voters. The town council could override it, and I, I think we need to be really careful of that. I don't, I don't know if that one would, I mean, it specifically says it has to go to the general fund, so I'm not sure. No, it says uh, to, it can go to economic development uses. Okay, that's what you're saying. Take, but again. Take the downs to, or the downtown district that was just created in the down CEA, well, the district. Um, in addition to approving the CEA, which had certain monies flowing back to the private entity, um, as part of that approval and creation of the district, we we're also retaining 3% of other money not going to them, and I, I, as my recollection is, uh, the qualified uses are to support economic development and um, traffic impact, or traffic improvements. Yeah, I, but that was specific, so we had a specifically carved out 
But this is, I mean, this is, again, to me, it's the vagueness. Satisfied for e economic development issues. I mean, that could be defined as just about anything. And it, it may be something, so I just think there needs to be, if we're going to stay true to the charter, that some of these things need, if, if, they, if, they, if they're at the $400,000 threshold or something we're going to do, there needs to be that. I don't necessarily share the same concern. Um, with a charter, the first example you gave where a project goes and it fails, so the voters have been asked and they, and they disapproved mm -hmm. or they did not approve, I think that's a, a pretty unique situation and that could be really ticklish for then for you to do something. But if there's a project that's not gone to the public and the only reason it will go to the public is because you need to borrow money in excess of 400000 I don't think you're, you have any conflict with the charter. Whether, whether you, maybe you're saying that um, in spite of that technicality or that legal interpretation, it's still against the will or the, the intent of that charter. I, I just think what I'm trying to say, and, and I'm sure another item we're going to have is redrafting the charter at some point, and it's probably sooner than later because it's been just about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Certainly the whole issue of the Scarborough Down TIF was there was a lot of voter debate about is that a referendum item or is that, should it go to referendum or should it not? So I just think we need to think about these types of things and how much authority we're giving to the town council to be able to maybe do things that the town does not support. And I think that's a problem because you said it may get dicey, but it, some, town, some town council, it changes every year, may decide to do some things that are really going to create issues. I just think we need a good check and balance here that whatever we decide to do as town council does reflect the view of the community. Do you have language that you would that would make? Oh no! Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not to exceed four hundred thousand. Not to exceed four hundred thousand. Well, <laughs> so, Peter, if I'm hearing you right, though, this is because if you look at so the Downs is the most recent easy example. So the issue with this document would be the same issue you might have with any CEA, right? Correct. So. For instance, if we're going to say the down CA was worth approximately $80 million, right, the mm -hmm. argument would be that's $80 million in infrastructure that, that the town has, quote, paid for without bringing it right. to voter approval. Right. 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 So I guess, I guess my question is, is it, is it, I mean, that, to me, that's the nature of what they, what CEAs are made for. So is it, is it more an issue with the document or is it more, is it a, a philosophical issue with CEAs to begin with, because yeah, I, don't, I guess I, I guess I don't see a scenario where, let's say, if we put a new building out to referendum and it fails, so the library would be a good example. Let's do. I, I guess I don't. How would a TIF then or a CEA turn around and build that build that library expansion? Well, because wouldn't you say wouldn't wouldn't this give you the latitude to do this by this policy in that first bullet? It, you know, we could argue that the TIF assistance for libraries, I mean, that's a yeah, strange no, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just trying but, to frame it somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, you could argue that's public infrastructure. Yep. You could argue it's in support of development that typically the community <laughs> might support, but you're defining it as typically. Right. But you didn't ask the community. Sure. Or in this case, if it did go to referendum and it got voted down, this would seem to be the way it's written that we could go ahead as a town council and cite this policy <coughs> as a way we would create a TIF for that irregardless. Does the, well, it would have to be a private entity that was building something. <coughs> but, I mean, so I guess I'm, I, I'm just trying to think through a scenario where this, like I understand, I agree that this is possible. It's what? And it would be possible, what you're saying. The, the scenario that you're concerned yeah. with, I, I think that's possible. I just don't know if it's, if it, if it's feasible or if, if there would be a scenario that it's happened. Please recall the, there are very particular statutory limitations as to what TIF funds can be used for, and they're, they're not identified there, and they, perhaps they should be, because I think many of those exclusions by statute will probably satisfy a lot of your concern. Well, we, we can't buy a, well, we could buy potentially a fire truck, but... We can't build a community center. You can't build a town hall. You can't build a library. Those are, by statute, not eligible for you. Yeah. 
but but there was some somewhere else in here too that talked about some some of the TIF could apply to either inside or outside of the districts created, which which again I think, you know, I, I think we should make this as buttoned up as possible. So 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 those are my concerns, and okay. I don't know if we're trying to wordsmith it tonight or not. Yeah, sure. But no. the, but those the, when you ask about concerns, those are my concerns as okay. I look at it. Does the language, Peter, in that first bullet that follows that, it says that would typically be projects the community might fund, and here's, I think, the key words, through the general fund or capital fund. Those aren't bonded monies. Well, the capital fund could be. I guess I would, so if, if, would that be a way to kind of solve that, though? Like, if, if it's, because that, if the concern is that it's a circumvention of the referendum process and the citizens' right to vote on infrastructure is a way to, to if we are wordsmithing, is a way to kind of fix that, would it be to tighten it up through taking out that capital fund part and, and say that they might fund through the general fund but did not do so? Would that satisfy? Uh, please recall, even the charter excludes uh, public works projects, street uh, projects from that requirement. That's, that's not, those projects don't go to the voters now. That may change with a rewrite of the charter, but that's uh, uh, excluded currently. Uh, is, is there a hierarchy in terms of, you know, federal law supersedes state law, state law supersedes local laws? Is there something within the town that says charter supersedes town policies? Or I, I don't know what I'm yeah. asking. Charter rules supreme, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think what I'm trying to anticipate is I, seeing that I've sat here for a while, there's lots of controversy about the 400, I mean, the 400,000 is probably not the right number in the charter, but for the people that drafted the charter, it wasn't supposed to be just for things that are bonded. That was an interpretation. They thought any capital expenditure over 400000 some of the authors, and I think there's hmm. an interest for some of the community that goes back to the pure. So without doing the charter, it's hard to know where yeah. that's going to be. But I just think this language, if this is going to move forward, we need to contemplate that. So. That's interesting. I never heard and heard it and, said and, that. And it'll be Rosenblatt in particular, I think. Well, it, it says in no uncertain terms, it is limited to indebtedness, the issuance of general obligation bonds. The town council could choose to spend ten million dollars on whatever it wanted, if you had it in the bank and did not require Some indebtedness. Second, it's well, the trigger is is. Well, oh, no, no. What I'm saying is that is the language that got put in there. But that, but some of the authors, the original intent was, if the town was going to spend ten million dollars for a capital project, well, that should have gone to referendum, whether or not it was bonded or not, because it's still a capital outlay. I so okay. I, all I'm trying to say this is this is vague. I think we should get it clear that it would be my my two cents worth. So I had a, a couple of questions. I know I've been uh, several raised so far, but. I'm, one, uh, what was the source for the document? Did we draw on any particular town? Or I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you've mentioned this before, but I can't recall what it was. Go ahead. Um, so this was pulled from um, Portland and Freeport. Was the primary the was the primary um, okay. base? But then it has. Um, Portland's was also looked at to see what, and there is some language that's pulled from Portland and adjusted for us. And there's actually, um, we looked at Mexico, Maine, yep. oddly has a TIF policy, and they had some um, areas that Freeport, neither Freeport nor Portland had, that we looked at and evaluated, um, and I think ultimately did not end up including, but were in initial drafts. Yep. Um, and did they speak at all to whether they're happy with what they had drafted or not, how well it's worked, or did oh. we get into that? Um, I don't think that I certainly didn't reach yeah. out to any of the councils that we borrowed policy from to ask them. That's a great question and something that would be a simple that phone might call. might be helpful. Sure. Uh, I share, uh, first of all, I think it's a, a great start. I, I think that, that 10 pages, you know, reasonably concise considering how complicated it is. I also like the tools that they had and the appendices, but I share uh, a number of the issues that uh, Councillor Hayes has raised with some of my own. Um, uh, that include uh, uh, the, the, the thing that I mentioned about how well is it working someplace else. I've also heard people argue, well, we get along fine without them. I've heard town managers uh, say we'd rather not have a TIF policy. So 
not Tom, but no, well, no, Tom I manager, have so that. I've known. I would generally subscribe to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, only that without a policy, you can't anticipate yeah. all scenarios. That's, and so that's, the, the, the downside of a policy is that you start to box yourself in. And, yeah. And, yeah. and have confidence yeah. that you control the final decision, whether you like the deal or not. Yeah. And I re remember very well the discussion we had about uh, uh, about the uh, referendum or not for the Downs. And I remember the major explanation for not doing one was because they had they had bankers who were getting impatient. You know, so it wasn't it wasn't some of the issues or comments that were raised this evening. So I'd say we I think we have more work to do here. Uh, uh, if we're going to go through the process, we should take the time to make sure we're clear on what it means and uh, so that others, you know, will be able to, so we can use it effectively and others, you know, uh, who follow us may as well. So I, I don't know what the process is for this in terms of uh, where it would go next, but I think we've raised a number of things that are suggestions for uh, ways to tighten it up. Um, we think we should get this committee comfortable with it before it goes further. And then maybe if it, there's substantial change, maybe just touching base with rules and policies as, as a courtesy uh, because they were, you know, the initial formers. Yeah. So the idea, though, would be if we were comfortable with it, then it would go to the council for a workshop, I would suggest, and then sure. a vote or something like sure. that. Is, is it's that not reasonable? terribly time sensitive. Yeah. Uh, you do have a, a large district in place. There's the potential for development to occur right. within that, and so there could be future things that come forward, not creation of TIFs necessarily, but probably credit enhancement requests. So do I have a, we have a motion for uh, the next step on this? Uh, okay. well, we should do that. Uh, should we, I mean, Peter raised some good points in there pretty early in the document. Should we, should we give them, I mean, are there others? Because the next step at this point, if I'm hearing this correctly, we have, I mean, Peter has this, a legitimate concern about the vagueness in mm -hmm. the rules and conditions. Yep. Are there others that we should task? Larissa and company with, or uh, there, are, yeah, there are others. I, mean, I, had, I, had, I had, for example, I had one. Uh, I have a problem with the process. The public, the town council is really not involved in the application process until step four. Okay. And so I have, I have an issue with that. Uh, and I haven't mentioned that previously, but that did uh, did strike me as something that uh, seems like the council, you know, as I read it, they don't have a role in the application process until the fourth step. Uh, there needs to be a way that they're made aware of the, you know, that it's in progress and uh, that we're not totally deferring to uh, SEDCO and the town manager until, you know, it's well underway. Well, uh, to, to that um, idea, I think that the, the thought was that SEDCO would be the first step to make sure that we are not bogging down staff yep. resources and yep. council time with applications that truly are not going to meet our requirements. You're doing a, a gating process, right? A qualification right. process. So those four steps are, um, if, you, if you read through them, um, the first one is, is just with um, SEDCO. You know, SEDCO is going to be the gatekeeper here um, to discuss the merits. So, so SEDCO staff will provide information on Scarborough's tax increment financing program to the applicants and discuss the merits of the development project proposals. So that's step one. Mm -hmm. So that's just a conversation with them. If SEDCO says, you know what, there might be something here. I'm not making any promises, but there might be. Then SEDCO reaches out to the town manager, and they meet to review the viability of the potential application. Mm -hmm. If the two of them together think, you know what, there might be some viability here, then the town manager has the authority to direct the town departments that might be needed to add information and to help complete the application to use those staff resources. Um, and it says in the last sentence of, of step two, the town manager shall have final authority to invite an application. So to just even say, you can go ahead and apply, because that application is going to take staff time. Yep. I don't have any issue with it with the way it's written, other than the fact that there's no notification requirement of the SEDCO or the town manager to let the council know that this is in an application process. Okay. So, so would, you'd be satisfied if there was a notification ahead of time, but not actually bringing the council into a workshop with them until later on? Uh, I'm okay with the idea of a workshop, but I, uh, I just I think that uh, uh, I'm you know the idea of the, that not happening until fourth step, and, and there sure. potentially is no obligation you know to let the council know hey this is in motion or how far sure. along it is. Uh, As a practical matter, I'd be remiss not to make you aware that hey we're having these conversations. That right. the, this is no different than many other things. 
I, I believe strongly that a, a proposal needs to be mature enough to be worthy of your time. Mm -hmm. You need something to talk about as opposed to a concept. And it's always a dilemma how far you take that. Some might say you've taken it too far. Um, it should have come to us earlier. And I pride myself on trying to know where that, uh, where that point is. But uh, that's a, it can be a difficult area. So others may differ. May this may be a, a hot button for me, and uh, you know I I respect that Tom needs and staff and Setco need to have the flexibility to do their jobs and to do that without uh, you know people uh, you know walking with muddy boots on the carpet kind of thing. But uh, you know I can think of a couple of examples where we've had issues with this, and uh, it, this is something that's pretty important. We could have large things like this coming down the pike. I think in the case of the Downs, if we had you know, had some prior knowledge of it before it was finally reviewed, we would have been in a better spot in terms of building support for it. So uh, we can debate this, but I, you know, I, it, there needs to be some sort of, in the least, in the notification reference uh, there, uh, or, or a notification obligation. Could it be satisfied for you in step two at the end where it says the town manager shall have final authority to invite an application, period? If an invitation is extended, the town manager will make the town council aware of a pending application. With that, uh, I'm okay for now, with that. Okay. okay. But uh, don't take that as uh, a buy order. <laughs> so, so as a as a motion. Drafting is pretty cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your pencil handy. <laughs> That's a good start. Sorry. So, so as a motion, do we want to do something like we could? You know, I think Tom said the finance committee can work on it, so the motion might be between now and August, we can give our comments to staff. Right. And staff can take, take come back with a red line version trying to incorporate sure. our concerns into a draft that we can look at okay. and then continue the conversation. That So if all of us will be, so my motion will be all of us, get our comments to staff that we're concerned about, Fine. let them take a redraft and we'll revisit this at the end of August. I'm not sure a motion is required. I mean, if okay. you're all committing right. to doing that, that would be terrific. I think we can turn around and provide right. some revised language. Okay with that? Yeah, that's, that's completely fine with Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, so this we'll will definitely be back on the August meeting. Yep. And just to clarify, we'll have some sort, from now to August, the goal is to take our input and yep. we work it. Come. Yep. Okay, all yep. right. And we've had a few notes from others as well. So We'll send a reminder out um, just... It's summertime, uh, <laughs> just so you don't lose sight of that and we don't get the comments last minute and aren't able to kind of produce language for your consideration. Yeah. So we'll send a, a note out to remind you. Great. Uh, but a good start and uh, great to get the ball rolling. I know the Rules and Policy Committee put a lot of work into this as well as town staff, so uh, very promising and a nice start. Okay. Uh, we were going to talk about town growth issues and approaches as I the next item and also uh, the last item. Uh, you know, discussion about how we might try to process uh, a, a look back at what happened in the, the past budget season and make some suggestions for how we might go forward. So I'm at this point open to, I don't want to lump those together necessarily, but uh, I, I think the town growth issues and approaches one is a very broad discussion. I know we had, Larissa and I had some discussion about that at the uh, end of a communications meeting last evening. So I, I you know, thought we'd talk about that, what are things that are on people's minds that are key priorities, and then uh, let's roll into uh, you know, a quick look back, but then a, a discussion about how we might commit to do uh, a more in-depth analysis of what worked, what didn't, and what we will do differently this year, and, and timing as well. So comments on growth issues and approaches, concerns with that, opportunities? Well, I'll start by, I thought the workshop we had last Wednesday, Wednesday before it was um, very well done and very informative. Uh, you know, reflecting back on it, I would it would be nice to it the and I don't I'm not trying to task anybody with a ton of extra hours of work here, but it, the scope of it was specifically for the incoming kindergarten class. So it would be nice to maybe let's expand that scope a little bit and somewhere between the ages of incoming, let's say three years old, to you know it, I. It was it was very informative. I think it, it, it illustrated the point that was I believe necessary to illustrate. However, expanding the scope of that I think would be a little bit more helpful for me. Um, Just to clarify, this was the uh, the permit uh, growth permit yep. discussion that Jay 
yep. uh, led uh, for the council. Well, yeah. specifically the the um, the number of incoming kindergarten. Yep. Right, yep. right. So I just that would be. Um, so that's just great. My I meant to add it at the end of my the workshop and. After reflecting on it, I just I would like to see a little more data as right. far as the scope of that is concerned. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry to expand it to to identify uh, from what sort of residential unit students are coming. Yeah, I mean, and like I said, I'm not I'm not necessarily tasking anybody with to redo this. Just my mm -hmm. thoughts were after when I came back and reflected on it was we talked about a very specific group yeah. of incoming kindergartners that in, which was again helpful for the point we were trying to illustrate. Um, but I would just like to see if that zero percent moves to seven percent, so to speak, if we expand the scope so of it. Like expand to K three, expand to like how much of an expansion were you thinking? I would, uh, let's say pre K to three, Some, something like that, right? We don't yeah. have access to pre K data. Okay, that's fair. Yep, yep. So I'll just drive around and count. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please allow us to do a public service announcement about that. Yes, yeah, sir. Call about yeah, a man right. who's looking at Trump. Like, that's just good stuff. Like, yes. Hmm. They said that you could let me in. Um, <laughs> but you've identified that as a key driver, and your suggestion is to keep monitoring it and also to take a more in-depth look. Uh, I don't know. What, you know yeah, and like yeah. I said, this was more an observation or reflection than okay. anything. It was very helpful for me, and I will echo what I said at the workshop. I think for the public, I know that there's and our growth ordinances, I know there's a pretty clear chart, but it would be nice to, and I put this on the communication committee agenda to um, boil that down to a one sheet for the public. So when we're talking about growth permits, it's an easy comparison. Because um, there's most certainly some com confusion around one unit does not make one permit all the time, so. Right. Um, okay. But that's, those were my thoughts from the workshop. Great. Other, other comments about growth issues and approaches we should consider? Um, yeah, it, and, and I apologize, last week that I had some issues, so I wasn't there. I, I think the intent, and I think it'll be something we'll revisit, was really also trying to get a handle on, as the town grows, do we have a handle on where the growth is coming from, how much growth, what does that look like for the future? And what's that going to look like? And the more important piece of that is what, it's, what is it going to look like for infrastructure needs the town's going to need? Because that goes back to the debt conversation that we have. I think as we look forward, there are some predictable things that are going to happen that we're going to need. I mean, traffic's going to become, is already, but will become an issue. So I think not only do we have the investments we're going to need in school and maybe at the library, maybe a community center, but what are we going to do with some of our roadways and other things and how does that? So I think it was more of getting a handle, are we comfortable where we are, how accurate have our projections been, but how do we use that as a planning tool going forward was where I wanted to get to out of the process, if that makes any sense. No, it does. I, and so I think I would suggest that we, we all clearly have some work to do or maybe a follow-up workshop that speaks specifically to the infrastructure could be helpful as well because this one was school enrollment which oriented, is part of yeah, which is part, part of that infrastructure absolutely part of it but i think it would be well worth our while to, to discuss more of the public works infrastructure and, and roads and i think i think that would be great education for myself so okay. and you guys to have a crystal ball about what that mm. yeah right for well and it, it quickly gets into the impact fee discussion right because yeah. that's the the well, basis of the intent of that approach which is is to as projects come forward is for them to tell us and for us to agree of their likely impact and them to be responsible for that well and I think that that was the other part of this conversation as I understand that a lot of those impact fees we haven't touched in a decade I mean no but they is, do, I mean they I mean, built in escalators well so yeah but, I mean, but the original benchmark when we set them yeah so when we, we have like what a sure. CPI escalator or something right. built in yeah but it's really going back, and, and part of that is, okay, once we identify the infrastructure cost that are coming, is, you know, we had heard, I know in the Scarborough Downs process, when we were talking about the school impact fee, we were starting to hear a whole lot of different numbers in other communities that are, I mean, some of the southern communities, so the consultant was using, you know, 20,000 for, for school, in so I think it's, so part of this is to feed mm -hmm. how do we, because that, that's been on the finance committee's agenda too for the last couple of years, is how do we go back and reassess whether we're in the right place for the impact fees? And do we need to tweak the base rates? 
Yeah, I, I can't disagree with the, with the statement that uh, you know they're all 10 years old or better, so they they need to be kind of truth again. I, I will say, and I'm, I'm fairly confident in this, we're one of the only communities that charges any impact fees. Yeah, right. um, and that creates a really competitive steps. issue too. Although it doesn't appear to have slowed growth. Well, it's, so that's so that's it's, a it's kind of ironic. Um, I think what it's done is driven up costs. So it, it speaks to our affordability challenges. I mean, a, a single-family home in Scarborough costs ten thousand more dollars more than Saco or or Gorham or anywhere else because of the impact fees associated in in our town. But again, it has not had a chilling effect on mm -hmm. on development. Not so far. Larissa, are the impact fees included on the the non-property tax revenue ratio on the dashboard? I don't believe so because the impact fees can't be used for operation expenses. Okay. Right. They go into reserve yeah, accounts. Yeah, because they're in their separate account. Okay. All right. So um, I, I'm going to... I think those are all great suggestions. Uh, I want to tie back to uh, this issue of the, you know, growing our tax base, you know, trying to look at sources of revenue uh, and also developing a, a much better handle on our expenses. I mean, this ties back to what are the priorities for our town at a high level? What are the things that are going to be our, you know, top two or three things that we stand for? Uh, and I, th I think that. Uh, uh, Larissa had suggested the possibility of doing, you know, uh, some process to develop some strategic principles or financial strategic plan. Did, did I? I want to make clear I did not suggest that we had to. Uh, <laughs> we were. <laughs> I'm interested to know more. <laughs> What's an <laughs> offer? I did not. Should we have that by August? <laughs> that is not how I would have phrased that dis that, that discussion. Um, <laughs> I took that as a buy order. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, uh, but. I think the idea that it raised in my mind is we uh, we've talked about the charter, we've talked about revisiting the comprehensive plan, we've really not had a, a dialogue or discussion as a town to confirm what are our priorities mm -hmm. going to be for growth, what are the services that we want to provide that are going to be outstanding, and and uh, and what are the choices we're going to make. We've not really had that That's discussion. Right. I know we have it every year at a department level, but at a high level we really have not had that. And even our bond raters are telling us, our ratings agencies are telling us, uh, you've got to increase li liquidity and reserves. I mean, okay, we know we got to do these things, but how are we going to do it? What are the principles that we're going to adopt that are going to help it, help it, us accomplish those things? So that that's something that is in my mind um, that we need to factor into this. Uh, this whole effort of trying to get our arms around growth in the town and how we're going to fund it. Kind of piling on to that, I think, and it probably either sits here with the joint finance committees, but that does get to the, as we talk about the budget process, we've always talked about level services, which assumes we're going to continue to do everything we do today. And then, and then we talk about unmet needs, which then applies. We do everything we do today, and then there's these unmet needs we need to fund. But you're right, we really haven't had that trade-off conversation about, as, as most corporations develop budgets, it's if you want to do more of X, you do less of Y, and we don't have a good mechanism for how to get there, which I think is a question you've been asking for a while. And then we end up uh, getting into uh, rating uh, reserve funds that we're trying to establish and or adding to the debt load. And it's pretty clear we we really will not be able to keep doing that one way or another. That's that's not a not going to be a recipe for success. So so I you know that I, I don't really know what the next step is on it, but these I think are uh, high high level concerns and issues about growth. Yeah. Um, Two points: there is funding in the budget. It remains to be seen how robust this survey will be, but we think it will be fairly robust that will begin to provide probably some qualitative aspects in terms of what people think of the services. What do you want yeah. more of? What we so do without? we should have the results of that um, in the foreseeable future. Great. Um, so you're coming back with a proposal for that, the analysis for that? Is that? I think we had talked about having, I, I think I had understood from Councillor Johnson that he had a lot of interest in communications committee really spearheading that effort. And so um, when he and I speak about the agenda for the next communications committee meeting, yep. that would be on the agenda. And um, Tom and I had spoken about how 
I should be prepared with some examples of firms that we could be partnering with Great. to Great. get that conversation jumping off from as fast as possible. Yep. So, so quickly, my thought in that regard would be to issue an RFQ, some sort of request for qualifications to identify a preferred consultant and then negotiate a scope based on our Great. need, our budget, so on and so forth. Great. And I think the communications group is the perfect venue to kind of Great. run that through. Great. So um, we want to, I know, and we had a wide range of discussion So that's going to be delivered this. in August, Paul? You're going you're gonna to have the answer Yeah, it's going to be done in August. Yeah, yeah, good. Good. Awesome. Good. Uh, the, the other thing I'll <laughs> point, um, we started the conversation with the Beacon project. That's the apartments on the parkway. Um, there was a detailed conversation around what is this, what is the likely impact, and for the first time ever, we've started to have a better uh, ability of predicting impact of development type. Mm. And that's a great example because it's finite. Uh, once it's fully developed, we can actually do a look back and say, how close were, were we? Mm -hmm. We perfected that even further with the Downs evaluation. That's still very much in process, but we now have tools, modeling tools, that can help inform land use decisions. If this choice, what, mm -hmm. what is the likely outcome? And so that's something that I don't think we've ever spent much time or enough time thinking about um, in informing those decisions in terms of uh, what are the impacts? Because not all developments created equal, for sure. And that, and actually, that's a great. As part of that growth issues, those learnings would be important too. To kind of make case studies out of those, or kind of, yeah, where, where are we spot on, and where did we? Yeah, the beauty of this in eighteen months, the right. project's going to be full, and we're going to be able to do a very clear look back. Some of the other ones have much longer lead times, and so it's. A decade before you actually have a well, sense. Eastern Village could be too, because didn't the fire department say they're now having to buy smaller fire trucks to be able to service the, the streets? And that was an unanticipated sort of consequence. So those are great learnings. Mm. So I, I I think it's great. I appreciate the offer, uh, your comments, Tom, and also the, the offer uh, from Paul to uh, take that on in communications committee. My only appeal on that is I want to make sure that we're just, it's not only value, but we're giving some thought to costs cost of services so that we have, you know, some ability to make trade-offs or at least lead us down the path for learning more about what those might be. And the other thing I think is I've been hearing from people is that they, there are other towns that have uh, revenue sources and streams based on activities that they, that they perform in their towns, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, summer permits, uh, you know, for rental properties, or it's uh, counting garbage cans, or you know that sort of thing. I'm not. I'm not proposing paper bag, but <laughs> but opportunities that other towns uh, take advantage of, neighbors of ours use that generate that generate revenues, or that may also be opportunities to to seek efficiencies. I know a lot of our departments do that already, uh, dispatching regionally, uh, ideas like that that our public safety folks do, but. It would be fun to try to harness the energy of the people in town to say, here are ways we could do, we could generate more revenues that aren't strictly tax, you know, mm -hmm. uh, real estate or tax, uh, you know, payer based, number one, and number two, uh, uh, cost opportunities where we can just do things better, we think more efficiently. Not pointing fingers and saying we're bad, doing mm -hmm. a bad job, but how could we do better? If there are specific examples of, what, of practices in other towns, we'd love to know more about that. Right. See right. if that makes sense here. So, any other comments then on growth and approaches to the, some of the broader issues? No, I, I, my one final comment is, is I think one of the things we can also work on and communications is I think it's important that we start, everybody start speaking the same language when it comes to growth, right? Yeah. And so we, for instance, the beacon has been invoked in, for many different <laughs> arguments, <laughs> uh, which are contradictory to each other. So it would be, and I think that's one of the great things about the workshop is we, we're starting to get to the point where if we're going to say something like the beacon that we all know and we're all talking about the same thing. So I think yeah. that's, in order for us to make real progress, I think we need to start speaking the same language. and. I, and I think there's been clear steps to get there, so yeah. I've been appreciative. Establishing a baseline of facts yes. that everyone yep. understands and agrees yep. to. And that wasn't a knock on you. No, I've no, myself, I, right? I think it's, <laughs> right. yeah. we're learning as we go. Right. I think what's a real eye-opener, uh, the growth permit uh, study, and I think that's really promising and an indicator of what we can do more of. So, yep. um, the, the last item is just talking about the process uh, for the past year. We, had, we touched on this a little bit last night in our... Uh, 10 to 2, uh, <laughs> 10 counselors and board of ed officials with two members of the public. Uh, and, but we had a good, you know, good discussion there about what, 
what they felt went well and what didn't. I thought we'd conduct a you know a little chat about that now as the what you know really the last uh, discussion item. Um, you know, with the hope of that we would try to commit to a time frame for when we would you know when we would really consider uh, the beginning of the budget cycle uh, for for approving a budget next year. So, so were board of ed uh, members present last night? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yes, I think this conversation really needs to include them as yes. our partner. So and, that's uh, good. And absolutely, and that's why we wanted to do this as a preliminary. Uh, but uh, the suggestion that that be an initial meeting. Uh, meeting of the joint finance committees, I think, is a great start. I think Sarah Lane actually asked for a joint finance committee meeting soon. So oh, terrific! I so we, she gets credit for it. Yeah. And we'll work with her to get a date. Um, the only thing I'd add is I had also checked with Land's chair. Her thought was it should be a full town council board of education debrief. Sure. So yeah. I mean, I think either approach yep. is fine. Mm -hmm. um, but we, but if we're going to do that, we probably should do it sooner than later. And I think it was more about, you know, thinking about the past budget season, the learnings, but what do we want to do differently yeah. for next year? How do we how do we set the stage maybe differently yeah. so we can get to that end point, which was, at least in, in my years on the council, there was less of the divisiveness that occurred in our community than in the past, which I think is a positive thing. And how do we, how do we capitalize on that? How do we learn from that? So budgets are much easier going forward. So could we start with the process of having the joint uh, finance committees meet and then um, do a quick turn on this and then have that as a workshop for the council to talk about ideas and get more input before making commitments to plans? Well, I think maybe it sounds like Leanne and Sarah need to kind of get on okay. the same page. On okay. Do they want the, the, to be the full board of education, or do they want it to go through I the finance committees mm -hmm. I see. and let them decide right. what's, what's best for the board Fine. of education? We'll start that, there, and then we can. We'll start there with a the large. I mean, I think either one of those models. Yeah. I mean, it, it would seem like it's something the finance committees. That's a good start to the season and, and the joint finance committee meetings, but. But we could cast them out for orders. What you're saying, yeah, mm -hmm. first step. Fine, I'm open to that. So we'll we'll. Consult with them and see how they'd like to begin, uh, you know, both groups or just finance committees, and we figure out how yeah. to structure that Thanks, and idea. process yeah. it. Any comments from the town staff on that? <laughs> <laughs> wow. We love so it. <laughs> and an extended budget, still talking about the budget. <laughs> I certainly have some, some thoughts about both those things, but I, I think they're probably better placed in the context yeah. of the overall discussion. So I'm okay. pleased to hold that. Yeah. Great. So uh, that that's really the end of our discussion items. Uh, if everyone's okay, we're going to move to just confirming future uh, finance meeting dates and times. Wednesday, July 24th at 5.30 is the July meeting, and then August 28th uh, at 5.30. I would just observe there were three items that I was just keeping track yep. that were to come back up in August. Yep. Um, it begs the question, what are we going to do in July? Well, I think, oh, no, in July, we weren't, we weren't, the minutes weren't. Can we shoot to have July be the joint meeting? Well, sure. Instead, instead of necessarily doing no. a five, uh, three of us, perhaps maybe no. make that late That's July date. Yeah. Or, Great. Or possibly it could be canceled, just as a <laughs> just, just as a or, <laughs> or it could be our day for our joint. <laughs> no, that's summer. that's probably an excellent idea. If you've already got it on your schedule, it's a matter of coordinating with BOE. Okay. Yeah. We'll work on that as a suggestion. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll operationalize that and see <laughs> yeah. how much support we have or uh, complaints. So. Well, I think it'll be easier if you propose a date. They're going to be yeah. easier yeah. to get back I to think as opposed to the the July date hurting okay. the cats yeah. around. All right. Good. We'll work with that. Um, at this point, we uh, would like to open it for public comment. I know there's a handful of folks here from the public, so if anyone would like to speak, uh, this is your time. And I think you probably want to turn that mic on and, you know, being the AV guy from you know, third yeah. grade. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Stereo. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Hello. Yeah. My name's Larry Hartwell. I live at 5 Colby Drive. Um, 
I think something that would help um, the folks setting up there and here and also the folks at home is to take advantage of the technology that we have in this room. A lot of dense, important information was discussed today um, and having it up on the screens for you, for us, and the folks at home I think would be, um, would make the information more useful and, and beneficial to everyone involved. Um, on the bonds, I have a question there. My understanding on bond, bond premium, is that uh, say the bond's a hundred a hundred dollar bond. Um, I don't, you don't go and buy my bond for a hundred and two dollars just, just for the heck of it. You don't pay me a premium. Uh, my understanding of paying a premium is that the interest rate on the bond is slightly above market rates, and so they're willing to pay a premium to, to buy that bond. So it's not free money per se. Uh, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but we always. We get into these discussions every year on the bonds and having $400,000 that came back to us. And um, I think a lot of people in the public may think that's like free money. Uh, I think it's a return of what we borrowed, but I, I'm not an expert on that. I don't know, but I just asked that question. And what percentage of our, our operating budget now goes to debt service each year? Uh, there's a percentage, I, I, now I don't know exactly what that is. But, does anyone here have that information? No, we'll get that to you to be accurate. Okay. Um, on the TIF policy, uh, I agree with Peter on it, on the vague language. You could drive a, a bus through that. Um, and I think relying on the state language, uh, it too is pretty vague. And, you know, you use terms like economic development, uh, you know, for the good of the public. These general terms that you can pretty much put anything through there. So um, it's a policy, so we've got something in writing, so that makes it slightly better than what we just went through with the downs and, and, and that whole issue. But we still really don't have any guardrails, per se. It's, it's in writing, but it's, it's just so vague. Those are my comments. Thank you. Uh, Barry, on your question about the bond, Tom, is that something you can? On, on which? The premium? His first question, yeah, the, the premium and what that means. And yeah, I do have a, a couple of white papers from our financial advisor. I'll share those out. Um, my understanding, it's a way for the investors to really hedge against inflation. So I, I don't think there's any penalty for us. Again, it's not something we ask for. It is part of the package they offer. It's worth noting all five bids had bid premiums associated. And so it it has to do with the complications of the, the tax exempt status of our, our our bonds and it's it's somehow or other uh, advantageous to the bid to, to the buyer obviously to include this uh, but I'll provide the white papers I'll let you read it for yourself and you'll probably be as confused as I am yeah but wasn't it wasn't the, wasn't the winning bid wasn't it to Larry's point weren't the earlier years higher interest rates and then they came down in the out years so that may explain why I mean, it's still the accumulative interest rate that was quoted. Yeah, the, the true interest cost is a blending of all of that. Of, of those, but it, it did vary by years. That may be why some are willing to pay on the edge that those rates are going to be attractive. Yeah, it, it, there are schedules right in your uh, meeting packet material that shows um, how those interest rates, and they all do change over the, the life uh, at varying levels. So I'll provide that white paper uh, out on the website. And I think, and that was part of the reason we decided to use some of the proceeds to, to buy down the bonds because the early year interest rates were higher. So we got a better return by not borrowing all of that money that we used to borrow. I think it was part of our reasoning, right? But mm -hmm. that's how we got there. And that's why as much as I understand about that. And then we'll certainly be able to produce the percentage of budget that's uh, related to debt service. That's easy enough. I just didn't want to hazard a guest. So I'd, I'd like to just in the uh, response to Larry's question about materials. So there are there are, have been very valuable uh, PowerPoint presentations. You know, we referenced the one, the growth permit one. We referenced uh, even the stormwater one that uh, was done by Angela. Uh, you know, if, can we, as a matter of course, make sure this stuff is posted, whatever may be shared in the in the meeting, be posted for the public um, to review? Um, 
And I know there are sometimes are confidentiality issues. I know in the case of developers, they're not always comfortable with providing uh, materials. But can I, is there you know a rule of thumb on this, or can we do that just as a matter of course? It, so we do to a certain extent. So these agenda packets that you receive are also posted publicly the week prior to the meeting. Yep. So um, for instance, the TIF policy was in that agenda packet on the town's website, as yep. were these annual metric updates. Um, as were the bond rating agency reports that Tom spoke to. So yeah. those are all available for this meeting in that agenda yeah. packet, and that was posted either Thursday or Friday of last week. Um, during the meeting itself proper, yeah. um, we certainly can, uh, there's, we can certainly have them on the screens. I think that sometimes that is a challenge from a viewer standpoint. Um, when we present something to you that has a lot of text it's, you know, yep. the, the TIF policy up on the screen is not going to actually be consumable by viewers at home. Yep. But in theory, they have, if they're interested, they have access to that on their computers, pulling that up as part of the agenda packet. I think yep. more to your point, Don, is the challenge we have is it's all available, but someone needs to know how, where to find it. Yep. And for us to serve up, one, to know what is of interest, uh, in yep. particular, among uh, all of the information, but two, how to serve it up kind of in a convenient spot that kind of hits you in the face. And we've got some challenges with the way our website is designed. Yeah. Uh, the only way to, for us to bring something up to the forefront is to kind of put it on our news feed. It's kind of the first thing you see. Yeah. And then it gets pushed down and gets it's there, but it's just, it, again, you've got to dig for it. So that's, uh, I'll call it a limitation, well, but uh, it's a never-ending battle. So I think... The BOE is really good at this. Mm -hmm. If you watch the BOE at any given time, a lot of times there is something behind them. Um, and I, so I think Larry's point is more, hey, this screen should be down. And for something instance, when you're referencing clause number two, that wouldn't be that difficult. I mean, if, you, if somebody wants to experiment with it, I could take the lead in the next meeting. And I don't mind having my computer projected up here to see if it is useful. Great. Um, it might be a disaster because of all the text and me scrolling, but but I do. But I, I think Larry's point more is yeah. sitting in the audience than uh, just to kind of clarify what I was yeah. referring to. There was when we're looking or when you're discussing a particular table yeah. and you're saying okay, this met or we're looking at the uh, the dashboard. Yeah. Those things would right. be yeah. kind of useful. Yes, I understand everything's out on the website and that's great. I'm glad it's there. We don't need piles of paper. For that, but just just those when you're having those specific discussions. On, on specific if we want to start, if we want to start small and see if I can yeah. next meeting. You're on. I mean, you're on. I'll try it, is and it, if it's a disaster, I won't, we won't do it. Is it Wi-Fi? Can, is it, can you project it through Wi-Fi, or does it have to be plugged? You can do Wi-Fi. Okay. Yeah. I'll come it's in on an off day, and we'll play around with There's it. There's a plug at that right. conveniently at the seat that he sits at yep. too. That's Great. Perfect. So I'll try it. It's very brave. Yeah. Thank it, you. The BOE makes the extra effort. Uh, most of their material is consolidated into PowerPoint. I agree. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. they've they've done some finessing and massaging of it to make it fit and make sure. it readable. Right. And that helped maybe take the burden off the town staff. But I'm pretty quick at zooming and stuff. We'll see what we can do. We'll try adding burden. burden. <laughs> Every confidence in you. I understand the point. We'll we'll do our best. Great. I, I just think it just helps us in terms of aligning and engaging the public. And people are, you know, trying to get more involved. We should make it easier for them to do that. So uh, I don't know if there are any other uh, comments or, or issues, but at this point, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All in favor? This meeting is now closed. I see that. Thank you. I mean, it's no different. It's no different than what we're doing. Like, the three of us are all yeah, using yeah. your computer right now. I'll try. Good for you. I mean, that's great. We all say. I mean, do you point they do it all the time? And it's much more I mean, but Tom's right in the sense where they...